Welcome again, everyone. Uh, today we're going to pick up our reading or review of 2 Corinthians. Um, and I'm actually a little head there on the screen, so let me scroll back up. So we're going to pick up in chapter two. By way of reminder, this book um, is a follow up, obviously, to the first letter that Paul wrote to the congregation at Corinth. And he's addressing several things here in this letter by way of reminder he's explaining why he had to postpone his trip when he initially thought he could come to the area um, he's also commending them for their positive response to one of the aspects he wrote of in his first letter we'll, we'll get into that today um, then also later he asked for donations for the members in jerusalem um, things are becoming incredibly difficult for them with what was happening between the jews and the and the romans especially and then he's he's still defending his apostleship, um, and we'll touch on that as we come to more of those things. The beginning of chapter two, uh, the first four verses are actually continuing the thought at the end of chapter one. And at the end of chapter one, he's explaining his change of plans. But in the last verse there of chapter one, let me just scroll up for you to see that. He actually says there, he says, that, you know, all all that we do and we in the collective sense because paul had those that worked with him that traveled with him so in the case of traveling with him luke traveled with him extensively but also timothy and titus when they were not taking care of other things that paul had asked them to take care of uh, later paul had silas as well with him um, and so you know paul saying it, it as those with me work with you we're not here to control your faith but fellow workers with you for your joy I like the King James here, oh, excuse me, it talks about helpers of your joy. So then to pick up the thought uh, as we begin chapter two here, so 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 1, <coughs> excuse me, he says here simply, but I determined this for myself that I would not come again to you in sorrow. Now, Paul had gone to Corinth in his earlier travel and then wrote 1 Corinthians as he looked or sought for an update as to how they were doing. That was the context of chapter of the first book, the first letter. So Paul's saying he didn't want to come to them again. He didn't want to take a second trip to them again just because he was upset. Verse 2, for if I make you sorry, then who will make me glad that he who has made me sorrow, made sorrow by me? Um, essentially what he's saying in, here is he didn't, want to always be correcting them. Um, no one wants that relationship on either side. It gets exhausting for the person constantly needing to correct and people that are constantly corrected begin to resent it after time. So going back to chapter one, verse 24, this should be a process of joy. Those that God has placed in positions of responsibility to lead, direct, correct, and so forth His people, and those that God is calling to be part of his family, um, there, there should be mutual respect. There should be give and take, like a family, like God is building. So then verse 3 says, I wrote this very thing to you so that when I came, meaning the correction, he wrote that very thing he says, so that when I came, I wouldn't have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy would be shared by all of you. Um, in other words, he wanted to see the response. He wanted to see the right follow up, if you will, from those individuals. And again, it's not that God places the ministry to control individuals. The desire of, of a minister of God should always be to be helpers of their joy. And this is what Paul's talking about here, that he wanted, when he finally was able to come, what he wanted to see is, joy confidence of, of their their calling the response to the correction and to see that growing in these things um in galatians 5 10 he wrote this he says i have confidence in you in the lord that you will have no other mind but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment whoever he is so a, kind of a sub context if you will of virtually every letter that we have recorded from paul is this aspect of these false teachers. I mentioned one of the things that he'll address here in this letter later on is the 
rejection, if you will, of his apostleship. Those that were saying, well, essentially, who's Paul? I don't care who Paul is. You know, I'm just as qualified as he is. Um, and so this context that there were always these kind of stirring the pot, if you will. Um, and so he says, um, verse four, out of much affliction and anguish of heart, Paul has this reputation of being just this almost onerous uh, apostle that he was just hard on people. That he was especially disrespectful of women. Um, you know, just this this Saul that we're familiar with in Acts that was quick to bring the hammer down and quick to see things as black and white and all of this. I I look at Paul when I read his writings. I I read of somebody who is to use the expression, he's not a teddy bear. You know, it's not this rough exterior, just this nothing burger on the inside where just anything goes. I'm not saying that. But he had this deep desire to see God's people succeed. And if you have that heart with anything, but especially with God's people, when things aren't going the way they know they should go, it, there, there's a bit of sorrow that comes with that because you know how much better it can be. And so he had, as he says here, much affliction and anguish when he wrote that first letter. This this was not an easy thing for him to sit and write. And I haven't written a fair amount myself in the last 20 years. To put to, across a thought, especially in the midst of conflict, is not something that you can do quickly or easily if you're really thinking about the best interest of the one on the other end. So he says, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be made sorry, but that you might know the love I have about it for you. So again, it was not Paul telling them you did wrong, and he wanted them to just feel awful about it. That might happen, but what he really wanted them to see, as he says here, is the love that he had for them. And I think this is one of the shortcomings in the culture around us. Too many parents, there are pluses and minuses of things. So one of the minuses in modern culture and families is that parents are reticent. That's probably not a strong enough word. But they they don't see the value of correcting behavior in their children that will not lead them down a good path. Because the problem is, if you especially with a strong willed child, it can take years of working with that child before you begin to see the thoughts take root and for them to begin to change. And so it just becomes this onerous thing they'd rather not do. Now, one of the things that parents, I think, do much better than they did 40, 50 years ago is showing children their love. But that love can't be predicated on compromising other things as they've done in so many other ways. So, they're, they're, as I said, there are pluses and minuses in these things. So, Paul, as a spiritual parent, if you will, and John talks like that extensively in his three epistles, um, especially the love that he had, almost like a grandfather. Paul's saying the same thing here. He says, I, I didn't to make I didn't do this so that you would feel awful. I did it so that you would see the love that I deeply have for you. Um, and in that regard, he did have a soft heart. It didn't prevent him from from having the hard conversations and for making sure that in, in making sure that they knew they needed to change. But it was not an easy thing um, because you never know how it's going to go. You never know what the response is going to be. You can hope, but this was what's, what's on his mind. So that or follows the thought there at the end of chapter 1. And so then he has alluded to this situation. It goes back to 1 Corinthians 5, the young man who was having an inappropriate relationship with his mother-in-law. The congregation thought this was okay in terms of what the modern premise is in so many religious circles is this coexists. You know, this this uh, concept of love, excuse me, that is flawed. They thought they were loving this young man by allowing him to continue it, that their, um, their grace, if you will, that they extended. But Paul, Paul was reminding them that it, you, you can't tolerate this. Because 
public sin. No. So make sure you understand what I'm saying here. Public sin. I'm not talking about sin that you're dealing with. Maybe no other person in the congregation knows what you're struggling with. Maybe only your wife or a close friend or whatever. I'm talking about public sin. When something becomes known on a public level, if it's not addressed, it never bears good fruit. Just because it's sin, it takes root, as Paul says in other places. And, and then it bears fruit. In the case of the Corinthian audience, the fruit it bore was that they begin to compromise other aspects of God's instruction, which Paul addressed as well. And so he addresses this situation in 1 Corinthians 5 more directly because of their positive response. So verse 5 here, he says, but if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow. This, this is the problem that too oftentimes we see the problem as being because of other things, other responses, other people, other circumstances. The human mind is very good about justifying ourselves, not my fault, even though we're the ones that have made the choices or allowed them to happen. And so Paul is saying, look, if there's any sorrow, it comes back to what this young man did. And so he clarifies, he said, not to me. This young man didn't sin against Paul directly, but he says, but in part, and I won't read the parenthetical right here for now, but in part to you all, the sorrow he caused was to the family at Corinth, the congregation at Corinth, because his sin, as I said, was well known, tolerated, and it caused, helped to cause, I should say, other issues. So let's read it with the other parenthetical thought. He says, the sorrow was not to me, but in part that I not press too heavily to you all. So Paul's saying, look, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but this is the reality. So this, we come back to this aspect of unity that Paul addressed in the first letter as well. That is to me, one of the themes of scripture. If, if we don't have unity in Christ, in God's instruction, that's why we have conflicts. That's why we have issues that need to be addressed. That's the reality of us being human. But with God's spirit, we should be able to work through those things. We should be able to grow past them, if you will. And so that when we have these divisions, they have to be addressed. Sometimes they rise to a level, a congregational level, where they have to be addressed publicly. So let me skip ahead a little bit here and read a couple of verses. So you might see them on the screen there. Proverbs 10 and verse 12. The Proverbs is obviously great instruction on a Christian level standpoint. That is living God's law on a practical day-to-day -day level. So when we have these kind of conflicts, when we know that there is sin involved, what is our response supposed to be from God's perspective? Proverbs 10 and verse 12, he says, hatred stirs up strife. If there's anger, if there's animosity, if there's contention, if there's hatred, strife is the result. This conflict is wearing. The contrast in verse 12 here, Proverbs 10, verse 12, but love covers all sin. Now, in the modern context, even in, in Christian churches, unfortunately, they think love then means tolerance. But it's clear through the balance of Scripture that if you do not predicate love on the law, then you are essentially throwing away the law. And then the fruit of what brings, excuse me, what comes from that law when it's applied properly, the proper type of love. Paul exercised the proper type of love. He reminded them, you can't tolerate this. This young man has to be removed because this is going to continue to create other problems and add to other problems. So you have to remove him. What he doesn't say explicitly in the first book is, but you can't hate the young man. This is what he begins to come back to here. But let's continue the thought. This matter of love coming, covering sin. So if we go to Proverbs 17 and verse 9, then he also, or uh, Solomon, then he writes here as well, he who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. What this proverb is referring to is the desire to protect someone so that they can repent 
and the sin doesn't define who they are. So I've had a few in the counselings for baptisms that I've done over the years, they've asked, do I need to tell you all my sins? And I always tell them, please don't. That's between them and God, especially if it's repented of, I have no business knowing, I, I don't have to know. If it's something they're still struggling with and they want help overcoming, then we can come to that point of the conversation. But this matter of love covering sin is allowing someone the space for repentance and growth. And then we don't repeat it. Even in the midst of a sin, the only time that that should be considered is when other people need to be involved to help the person overcome. So you may end up with a handful of people involved in whatever situation, but it doesn't go outside that circle any further. This is, we call it confidentiality. This matter of confidentiality in these conversations um, that you, you have, of course, included those that need to know in order to help potentially bring a positive outcome, but it doesn't become everybody's business. Um, this is why gossiping is so bad as well, that Proverbs touch on as well. Um, Galatians 6 and verse 1. So Paul's beginning to set the stage here to, to help them see this aspect of love as it's properly defined, but then to also allow this young man to be where he needs to be. So Galatians 6 and verse 10, it says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So let's continue in verse 6, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. Paul then begins to address, go, go, goes back, if you will, to his first letter, 1 Corinthians 5, to talk about this matter of this young man and his mother-in-law. He says, this punishment, which was inflicted by the many, is sufficient for such a one. So the congregation agreed with Paul. This young man can no longer fellowship with us, attend with us on the Sabbath, because he needs to work on overcoming this. And that, I suspect just knowing the times I've gone through that was probably a very hard thing for them, because they feel like they're just punishing him, throwing him out. And it, unfortunately, at times, what we call suspension or disfellowship has too many times taken that approach. Let me pause here and just re rehearse a few things. United does have a suspension slash disfellowship policy. The whole point of both of those actions is to be a last resort to hopefully wake up, if you will, the individual of the seriousness of what's going on. They haven't responded properly up to this point. <laughs> Excuse me, they haven't taken the correction. They haven't done the, uh, the work, made the effort to overcome. It's still somebody else's fault, all of these various things. Suspension is meant to be a less drastic response. Essentially, I would go to a person as a pastor, as an elder and say, look, this has got to change. And for now, you can't be here. You and I will talk. You can set up a plan to do that, to stay in touch. I'll help you, you know, we can sit down, we can make a plan. I can remind you of the things that you need to do in terms of overcoming and why. But until until I see repentance, you're not coming back. Disfellowship is a more permanent action because even suspension has not motivated the individual for change. At which point you simply tell them you're not welcome to attend here anymore. Now, in our history, especially going back into the Worldwide Church of God, we would have another step called marking. And Paul mentions that in other places as well, where he identifies specific individuals. And we did do that. And I don't know that that's publicly necessary. We, to my knowledge, have never done it in United. Um, but it is still part of that process, if you will, of disfellowshipping. There should always be given allowance, if you will, for an individual to repent to change, and if we see that, for them to be welcomed back to the fellowship. So keep that in mind as we walk through this next section. So verse fit six, to, to repeat, this punishment, which is inflicted by the many, is sufficient for such a one 
so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive him and comfort him, lest by any means such a one would be swallowed up with his excessive sorrow. So the punishment is whatever the punishment is, even in child rearing, the punishment should always one fit the infraction. But the punishment should also be explained in terms of why the punishment came and what should change. So this is what Paul's addressing here. Okay, the punishment was exacted. This young man was told not to come. He had to change, stop the behavior. But he says, look, now that he has, and that's why I read Proverbs 10 and 17, Galatians 6. Now that he has shown repentance, then you should forgive him and comfort him. As a pastor, I have to accept when someone says to me, I've repented of that. Because I can't know their heart the way Christ can. So I, I have to accept that unless or until they show me that it wasn't true or that it wasn't permanent. Because I can't read their heart. I can only go on what they say and hope that the fruit then follows. And this is what Paul's talking about. Forgive him. We don't forgive him in the sense that we make the payment. We have now a, uh, applied Christ's sacrifice. That is, we don't hold anything back in terms of someone being part of our fellowship now. Comfort him. Change is always hard, no matter what we're talking. It's especially hard when you're confronted with something, I'll, I'll use the term, of a character nature that kind of hits at our identity and it's perhaps core in, in some ways or at least affects the core aspects of who we are, that that is overwhelming. And so to go through that and to be isolated, this is the comfort Paul's talking about. To, to ostracize somebody long term doesn't help if they're trying to change. If they're determined not to change, then it's the protection of the family. They, they can't be there. So he didn't want them to continue this rejection, this putting out, if you will, because he didn't want him to be swallowed up, as he says, with excessive sorrow. So once the person has is showing fruit of repentance, then there should be restoration, there should be forgiveness, and the sin, as far as we're concerned, it's not brought up anymore, ever. So verse 8, he says it much clearer and direct here. Therefore, I beg you to confirm your love towards him. And love is known through our actions. We, we say the words. We can apologize. We can tell someone we're happy to see them change. We'd love to see them back at church, all these sort of things. But the actions are what validate those words. So he says, I beg you to confirm this. Show him. Verse 9, for to this end I also wrote that I might know the proof of you, whether you are obedient in all things. So he wrote it waiting for their response, hoping that as called out members of the Bride of Christ, as initial members, if you will, of the family of God, this is what he hoped would happen, the proof of you. Again, our actions is what are what show each other and God whether the words we say are true. And it's not the words are not important, but the words have to be backed up with actions. So he says, whether you are obedient in all things. So they were. They, they put this individual out. The matter was addressed. The individual was repentant, remorseful. And so now he's saying, okay, th this is what I wanted to see, so welcome him back. Verse 10, now, I also forgive whomever you forgive. So, Paul was, to kind of use an 1800s term, he was an itinerant pastor. He rarely stayed in areas long enough. Ephesus was one of the few exceptions where Paul stayed for a long period of time. Mostly, he was like a senior pastor, to use our modern term in United, where he oversaw other pastors. And so, he's saying here, um, if you have made this decision and you see this fruit of repentance, then I accept that. I accept what you're telling me, which engenders trust, doesn't it? 
Again, going back to the end of chapter one, Paul says, I'm a helper of your joy. So he's not micromanaging things. This is another aspect of why I say Paul, in my mind, Paul gets a bad rap. He's not this overbearing, micromanaging, controlling individual. So he says, if you forgive him, I do as well. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven the one for your sakes in the presence of Christ because of the rest of duration. If, if Paul's saying, if you see these things and he's being restored, then why would I not? Why would I not want to forgive this individual and allow them to move forward? Because the reality is, if we're honest with ourselves, every one of us has probably been at that point at one point in time or another in our calling. I don't want to be removed forever. If I've offended somebody, I want to know. And hopefully we can work that out. And even if we can't for now, ultimately we have to, but if we can't for now, that we're at least civil and Christian towards each other. So continuing in verse 11, he says this. All of these things that no advantage be gained over us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes, his devices. Because Satan will use any point of difference as a wedge if we allow him. He'll use anger. He'll use this judgmental nature that unfortunately we can have too easily. He'll use this condemnation. He'll use bitterness at any point of division. He'll use those things to destroy any unity we might have. He doesn't care what it is, as long as he can compromise our unity with each other and with God, especially. So he says, look, I'm a big part of this. I'm, I'm really grateful for. I'm happy to see because I don't want Satan using this as a point to continue this division. So he trans, uh, transfers on or segues, I guess a better word, into another thought here. He says, now, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, Gospel is simply teaching that has been unfortunately misused in the greater Christian context. It's not the message of Christ. It's the message he brought. So the gospel of Christ, he says, when I came to Troas and when a door was opened to me in the Lord, I had no relief from my spirit because I didn't find Titus my brother, but taking leave of them, I went out to Macedonia. God directed him through his spirit, Paul, directed Paul through God's spirit to postpone this trip. This is going back to one of the things he's addressing in this letter is the reason why, excuse me, why he was delayed. So he says, I was hoping to have Titus with me, but I didn't, but I needed to go to Macedonia. Now, there's questions you can read in the commentaries. Uh, it seems that Paul was expecting to meet Titus as he was coming from Corinth after Paul wrote the first letter. Evidently, Paul heard of the result of that letter either from Titus later on or for someone else. But again, this is part of why he was delayed. In verse 14, then he says, And now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph to Christ. And this even goes back to this matter of this young man, 1 Corinthians 5, and what Paul addressed in the previous verses that we just rehearsed. If we allow God to work with, through us, if we follow his law, if we apply that with his spirit, if we then allow trust, I guess is what I really mean, if we trust God then to work with us properly, it will always come out to the best response, the best outcome possible. This is what Paul is saying. So it does build on what he said before. God always leads us in triumph. Satan and, and the Father especially, but God in general, Jesus Christ and the Father, they could not be more polar opposites than they are. Everything that God does is seeking to edify and build us up and lead us into his family. Everything Satan does is destructive, divisive, and seeks to remove us from a relationship with God. So if we keep that in mind, then, even in the midst of really terrible things in our lives, 
we can have the confidence that God will triumph in these things. He'll bring to pass what we need to see, what we need to learn. The result of the trial physically may or may not be resolved, meaning go away. But in the end, that doesn't matter because we also triumph in knowing that we're going to be fully, completely in God's family, eternal spirit beings with his mind. So he says, not only does he triumph in us this way, but he reveals through us the sweet aroma of his knowledge in every place. We begin to see God's hand in so many other areas of our life. When the, we're in the midst of anger and bitterness and division, we, we can be able to see these things. The still quiet voice that he talked about there with Elijah. If there's the noise of our life, the noise of the world, the noise of Satan trying to influence our thoughts, we, we don't hear that. It's much, much harder to hear it. So Paul is a reminder here. He, he's bringing them back to some basics of relationships with each other and with God. So verse 15, for we are a sweet aroma of Christ to God. Now, if you remember in the tabernacle and even later at the temple, there was the altar of incense, and that was to be constantly burning. We know from Revelation that God views our prayers as this incense, because think about the, the globe, the world. There's always daylight somewhere, right? And ideally, that's the, the awaking portion of our, our life, our daily life. And at some point, at least once a day, there should be some prayer there to God. And this is then, as the world revolves, it's just constantly going up to God is the way it should be. He wants that relationship with us. And so... Even our actions as we live out our calling is much like those prayers where it's this sweet aroma to God because he knows where it will end. He knows what that will do for us and, and, and how we can come into his family. And so he says, we're this sweet aroma. You know, it's not bitter. It's not sour. It's not repugnant. It's sweet. It's, it's pleasing. So verse 15, for we are a sweet aroma to Christ in God. We, as we live our lives, we're simply this. To those who are saved and in those who perish, meaning those that die in their calling, those that are called along the way. We're not fully there yet, right? We're still the babe in Christ, the, the born again aspect. And we touched on that in earlier Bible studies. Born again is a two-step process, right? Physical conception is a two-step process. There is the conception and the development within the womb to be able to be born to continue as a life. But it has to be protected for a time, doesn't it? It has to be able to grow, be fed, and be nourished in the right way. And then physically born to grow to maturity. Spiritually, it's not much different. We're to be ideally protected in the mother, which is the church, what God has established through his son, that we're nourished, <laughs> that we're protected, and, and that we have a safe place to grow so that we can be fully born into God's kingdom. We're not there yet. But this is what Paul's talking about. Um, before we leave this thought, let us let me read Ephesians 5, 2 to you. <coughs> Excuse me, Paul says here, he says, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Um, I, I don't have this in my notes, but it just came to mind. Let me read to you Hebrews 12. Um, that's not the verse I'm wanting. The verse I was thinking about was uh, where Paul's talking about um, to sacrifice our lives, which he says is our reasonable service. Um, it's the least we can do. Our, our living our life because of what God has given us through his son, the sacrifice of his son on a spiritual level, but even on a physical level, the promise of blessings, of healings and so forth. Uh, 
um, how wonderful all that is. That we can triumph in Christ, that we're this living sweet aroma. Um, so back to Second uh, Corinthians two. Um, sorry, I just noticed the heading on my page is wrong. We'll have to fix that later. Um, Second Corinthians two and verse sixteen. He says, "And those that perish in verse fifteen, to the one a stench from death to death." And to the other, a sweet aroma from life to life, who is sufficient for these things. Um, the Greek world, especially the Roman world, the pagan world, saw Christ um, as ineffective. You know, first of all, they couldn't wrap their mind around the fact that God, any God, but God would come become human and die for mankind. The pagan gods never, ever did that. So this death to death, we can also kind of apply in this way, those that as a crucifix, you know, almost sort of worship this dead Christ. There was value certainly in his death. It was necessary for God's plan of salvation to continue, but we do not worship a dead Jesus. We're saved by his life. So this is the end of that verse there. A sweet aroma from life to life. That is from our life to his becoming like his. But in life bringing life, even as we live out his calling. So then the last verse here in chapter two, for we are not as so many peddling the word of God. And this is part of what Paul was talking about. Even going back to his first letter, you had those that, to use a term, were making merchandise of God's people. They saw that, hey, I can make a living out of this. I, I don't have to believe it. If I say the right words, these people will send their tithes to me. I can live a good life. And it always pains me when I drive by some of these Christian churches. And you can tell who the leadership is. Sometimes they have their own special parking. And they've got these high-end cars out there. And I don't have anything against high-end cars, but when you're a pastor, when you're called to lead God's people, it is not a calling to wealth, which means that wealth came from somewhere. I, I don't want to ever be accused of making merchandise of God's people. And so Paul is saying, look, I'm not in this for the money. <laughs> and Paul had a comfortable life, didn't he, before God called him in some ways. He, although he was wrong, he knew his vision for life. He knew what he wanted to do. He was good at what he was doing. He was very knowledgeable. Um, he had a, a heady position. I mean, he was basically reporting directly to the Sanhedrin. So, I mean, he didn't have to do this, if you will. So, but he's not peddling this. It's not something he's doing for money. Yes, the workers were the root of his hire, but if you do it for the money, you're going to get tired of it at some point. And there were those, unfortunately, there still are those who simply do it for the paycheck. And so Paul's saying, look, we're not like all of those people. He says, but rather as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, we speak to Christ. He says, look, I don't want to do that. As I said, I don't want to be accused of peddling the word of God, Paul says, because I answer to God. And, and those that have forgotten that, We'll have an unpleasant conversation, I'm sure, with God at some point. But that's between them and God. The responsibility of anyone that preaches God's word is to be reminded, to have in the back of our mind, we answer to God in these things. So he simply reflects here what he said earlier. We speak in Christ. The gospel of Christ, as he said in verse 12, we speak his words. And I've, I've mentioned in other occasions, you know, a few conversations I've had over the decades with individuals that want to argue Pauline the law of theology versus Christology, the teachings of Christ versus the teachings of Paul. And those that take that position say Paul's teachings take precedent over Christ's teaching because Paul had to explain what Christ taught. Well, then he wasn't a very good savior, was he, if he couldn't explain what he came to do and be and what we need to do in following him. So he didn't say, I come to speak of my words of Christ. We speak in Christ. 
So this is a direct indictment to those that desired a personal following. Uh, probably the most famous in the New Testament accounts is uh, Simon Magus there. Um, and he developed a whole, unfortunately, pagan theology based on his twisted view of Christian, uh, Christian, sorry, Christology or Christianity that exists even to this day. But we don't mingle paganism. We don't, this is why we don't mingle paganism. Christ never taught these things. We never draw in philosophy. And, and one of the irritations I have even continuing on is that so many use, you know, Hebrew scholars or Greek scholars or other theologians to explain the word of God. The value of that is perhaps to be reminded of something or if there's historical, cultural, archaeological stuff that can sort of broaden the picture or understanding. But when it comes to truth, it's God's spirit working in our minds. It's, it's not all this other information. It gets too muddied when we when we go outside of that. So. The next chapter, then Paul gets into matters of this new covenant. And there's a lot to talk about there, so we'll leave that for next time. But um, 2 Corinthians has quite a bit in it to ponder and consider. This matter of restoration of people, this matter of the triumph that we can have in Christ, and the understanding of how that applies, you know, in all of our relationships and, and what we preach publicly and, and privately. All right, so next time we'll pick up 2 Corinthians 3.